Monkey is swallowing. Snake says swallowing. Next, a swallow too will fly and come and swallow. You ever swallow in a hollow galu. Making a whole lot of halabalu. Jale kalu. We know say you chop the money some, so give me the loot. Do you really want a revolution or just your turn? Cause if you really want a revolution, all this for Ben. Hello and welcome to this session. My name is Rene Maya and uh, we'll be talking about social media policing by the state on this panel. Um, more than half of the global population, that's 51% of all of us worldwide, we now use social media. Um, yes, that means at least 3.9 billion people use social media today. And on our continent, in Africa, uh, the smartphone and the internet has leapfrogged Africans into active political debate, electoral participation, as well as a watchdog role. But just as social media is increasing political mobilization, African governments at all levels have mainly responded with clampdowns. So how do we refine or redefine our relationship with the truth in the social media age, as well as in what is now a post-truth society? On this panel, you'll be hearing from Hopewell Chinono. He's a journalist and documentary filmmaker who has and is currently undergoing state policing in his home country of Zimbabwe. With us is distinguished legal practitioner and human rights campaigner, Ayo Obe, who also serves as secretary of the African Book Group. And last but not least, joining us at some point is Yemi Adamoleko. She's the executive director of Enough is Enough Nigeria. That's a non-partisan network of individuals and organizations committed to building a culture of good governance and public accountability in Nigeria. Straight away, because I know there's a lot of things I personally want to know as well from this distinguished lineup. Um, state policing of social media generally can be defined as the use of physical, administrative, and legal organs of the state to control social media use and access. So, Hopewell, I will start with you, if you don't mind. Um, your recent expose of alleged government corruption, um, which is connected to the handling of coronavirus supplies in your country, Zimbabwe, actually brought agents of the state to your door. And your first instinct was to live stream. And social media has played a big role in what has happened to you um, and what has been discussed about you since then. Can you tell us what you can of your experience of state policing via social media? Thank you very much for having me on the panel. What happened was that uh, I've been using social media for some years now as an accessory of delivering not only news, but analysis and commentary. So from around end of May, I started putting out an expose of how COVID-19 funds were being looted by those very close to the president, including the Minister of Health, uh, and in some instances, members of his family. And uh, when I started doing this, I started getting um, uh, senior government officials and senior ruling party officials um, saying that I was tarnishing the image of the president and his family. I should stop that. The spokesperson of the ruling Zanupia party had a press conference where he named me by name, calling me unscrupulous for exposing the scandal. But they, they were basically angry that I'd also shown that the president, all members of his family were linked to this. So after this press conference, a couple of days uh, decided to come after me uh, I had eight state agents come to my house. Uh, four of them had AK 47s. Two were from the Secret Service, and the other two were from the law and order section of the police service. So I called my lawyer, Ms. Beatrice Mtetwa, and told her that I want all these state agents at my house. What should I do? Then she advised me to ask for an arrest warrant. And when the arrest warrant was not produced because they didn't have one, they then forced their way into my house 
using the butt of an AK-47, they hit a sliding door, the glass of my dining room, and they walked in. As I heard them walk in, I was in my bedroom. I then decided that since there have been a lot of abductions by the state and the state has been refusing or rejecting these accessions, I should record as they walk into my bedroom. So I started live streaming on Facebook. And as they walked into the bedroom, everyone could see who they were. And they immediately asked me to put the phone down. Initially, they thought that I was recording to my, um, to my, to my phone storage. They didn't realize that it was a uh, live stream. And um, that sort of helped me in a way because it was not to be an abduction, but because that evidence was now on millions of phones across the world, uh, they had to produce me. And so I was taken to the central police station in Harare. And um, that's how I ended up being taken to court and being thrown into prison. So part of what happened that is relevant to this panel was that it didn't just stop there. Um, while social media, as we said, turned what could have been a mysterious living person case into an actual produced this person, they are being um, held for their work. Your social media accounts were also, if I'm correct, um, used against you and also interfered with. Could you give us a bit more of that type of light? Because you are coming from the journalistic aspect of state policing of social media. And then we could go on to Ms. Ayo. What happened was I've been charged with incitement uh, to public violence, which is a very frivolous charge. Uh, it cannot be sustained in any reasonable court of law uh, based on what they've produced so far, which is four tweets. When I talk about a protest that was being earmarked for the 31st of July, and this protest was an anti-corruption uh, protest. So they went and took these four tweets and then used them as the basis, one for arresting me, two for bringing me before the courts, and three for throwing me into jail without trial. So what we are seeing is an increased policing of social media by the Zimbabwean state. Um, but they use this as a deceitful basis for arresting people that they consider to be they are critics or their adversaries or political rivals. So I'll quickly go to you, Ayo. Um, so we sort of have the legal angle. State policing and uh, surveillance on general political um, participation, we tend to notice that it's achieved either by legislation, taxes on social media use on the continent, or just outright shutdown of social media applications or shutdown of the internet as a whole. And I think um, Hopewell mentioned one of the buzzwords in all the species of legislation on the continent, incitement, treason, hate speech, misinformation, fake news. Have I missed anything out, Hopewell? Um, <laughs> So my actual question, Ayo, is can you sort of help us approach the legal aspects and sort of commonalities to state policing of social media that we're seeing in Nigeria or across the continent in general? Well, I think that um, it's important that we understand that at the beginning, the concept of the social media or in fact the whole access to the internet was, was free. And then it started to be used for criminal activity. And by criminal activity, I mean to defraud people, advance fee fraud, and so on and so forth. So that government on the continent, and particularly in the ECOWAS region, actually took the position that um, we need to regulate this activity on the, on the internet. Because although we talk about social media, I can't really say I mean, I'm a Twitter person myself, but there are people who are Facebook there. Are, there's also the, the not so public aspects such as WhatsApp and so on, which is composed of groups that um, people think are closed groups and where, quite frankly, a lot of this um, of the things that concern um, uh, anybody um, fester. So I'm just going to talk about general um, Internet access rather than 
limiting myself to social media because it also happens on on email groups as well and the point is that as you as governments now said well, look we have to attend to this and so the ECOWAS countries African countries need to regulate this sort of thing then it now became something that as more people had access to the type of social media that everybody can put their views out to the whole world via agencies like Facebook and Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat or whatever it is, that governments started to understand that these things can be used against our own purposes. I wouldn't necessarily say against us, but against our own purposes. And that's where the whole concept of can we just leave this space unregulated? After all, um, if somebody is going to use a broadcast medium like television or radio, they have a code and they have to um, they have to subscribe to they have to get a license and so on. And um, should we treat this as anybody can set up a printing press in their backyard and you know just like a newspaper where all you have to do is maybe have your address of your editor or do we treat it as broadcasting? And I think that the part of the problem and the difficulty that we've had, because I have to confess, um, Rona, there is no easy answer to the interface between regulation of social media and um, the constitutional rights or the rights that certainly we have. I won't just limit myself to Nigeria, but I would say that the African Charter on Pe Human and People's Rights means that it applies to the whole of the continent, that these rights of freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom to receive and impart ideas, all of those things are guaranteed to people in Africa, whether under the African Charter or under our individual government um, governments. So we, we have this, um, and, and we're in this space where we are trying to find out how do we stop it from being a complete wild west where anybody can put out any lies that they like and indeed incite. And on the other hand, who makes that decision? I would say that in the more developed countries, the decision has more been about attacks on individuals, threats against individuals, hate speech against individuals who are nothing to necessarily to do with government because people in government are expected to be ready to take a certain amount of flack. But you see, what we found is that those kind of laws, for example, in Germany, Germany, I would say, has the most robust um, system where, for example, yeah. you're not a... I'd like to agree with that because yeah. I live in Germany and I'm, you know, also there. <laughs> They have a very robust system. They want to prevent people from spreading um, Nazi propaganda, um, from spreading hate speech, anti-Semitic um, uh, tropes, anti or, or general anti-racist um, tropes, preventing the spread, the spread of misogyny, threats against women. And I have to say that um, as somebody on Nigerian Twitter, I should say that when I see some of the things that are said in um, Twitter overseas, that I think that Nigerian Twitter is still very polite and well-bred. But nonetheless, those people also need to be protected. But when a private individual needs protection, and then the next thing we hear is that, no, the, the government people also need to be protected, then that's where the problem arises. Because we've heard on more than one occasion where government officers say talk about bringing us into ridicule, it's not just not telling the truth about us, but actually the complaint that you are bringing me into ridicule. In Nigeria, it's particularly concerning because we had this situation where when our current president was a military dictator in the 1980s, he introduced what we are by law required to call the obnoxious decree number four, whereby one of the things that you could be um, arrested and convicted for was bringing a public officer into ridicule. Now, to the ordinary mind, ridicule and democracy are like twi like Siamese twins. You cannot separate them. So um, if you can't poke fun at 
your rulers or your leaders, even the people that you have democratically elected, then you have a problem. But um, uh, when our government proposed, or not our government, I can say, when some legislators proposed hate speech, these are the sorts of things that they're talking about. They're not talking just about, um, you know, inciting people against people, others because of their race or their ethnicity or their religion or their gender or their lack of gender for that matter, but also about telling people that your government is messing up, complain about them. And these are the areas that governments in African countries are looking at to see how can we prevent our citizens from complaining about us in this way, from poking fun at us because something that we said yesterday is turning out to be something different to what we're saying today. And um, all of those things can be called ridicule. But when one person's view is that this is um, pointing out the contradictions in your position, and I may even be using humor to do that, and on the other hand, another says that, yes, but you sh if you were going to point fun at me, you should also take into account these other aspects. And, you know, I mean, I, I mentioned this because I was particularly interested when a cartoon had been put out and a cartoonist was being um, criticized on Twitter for cartoons that we had put. And part of the argument was that he's giving out fake news because he hasn't put into the cartoon some things that we, who um, don't like his cartoon, think he ought to have included. And so we're getting into a, an area where I can see that we all have very, very different perspectives about what constitutes hate speech. I mean, if we look at um, Hopewell's um, experience, he was simply broadcasting what was happening. He was inviting people to a, a, a demonstration but under the African Charter, we have freedom of association. We have the right to peacefully um, demonstrate and make our views known to government. So simply, and, and if we can't invite people to our demonstrations, then, you know. And, you know, the word incitement is also interesting because when you say he incited people to complain and to criticize government, yes, I can incite you to criticize government, but does incitement mean that I'm inviting you to overthrow the government? in a non-democratic or non-constitutional way. Our governments like to pretend that once you tell people you should vote this government out, then they're being incited. In fact, the proposed legislation in Nigeria specifically said that if the um, comment on social media affected the outcome of an election, and again, the normal reaction is, why else am I posting my comments about the government on social media if I don't want to affect the outcome of an election? And yet these are the sorts of things that are coming into play in the discussion of whether we should have state regulation or not. But then, Rona, I will hand it back to you with the question, if we don't have state regulation, what kind of regulation are we going to have? Or should we have no regulation at all? Let me ask you, Hopewell, let me throw that question to you. You are now bearing the brunt of so-called regulation. It might be ad hoc, it might be made up, it might be trumped up the charges, but do you really think we should not have any sort of um, regulation as to the use of social media? Where, as somebody who is undergoing this, where do you think the lines should be drawn? I mean, there's nothing wrong with having um, some sort of regulation on social media because it protects all of us. Social media is just like a newspaper, um, like the good old television. Uh, it's a platform that is used to share information. It is the information that we share that people should be concerned about. Am I sharing head speech? Am I sharing good old news? Uh, are we having a discussion about um, what's happening in our country? How do we regulate that? So with social media, it's like power without responsibility. What we're looking for is a balance of having power to communicate and using these very useful platforms and instilling discipline 
and responsibility in what we do. So for instance, in my country in Zimbabwe, it is the only country in the world that is in a way so terrified of journalists coming onto social media and sharing truthful information. Of course, other parts of the world, we see different shades of, of that kind of paranoia. But in Zimbabwe, it's absolutely gone crazy where if you say something that is within our constitution, it's enshrined in our constitution. For instance, as I always said, our constitution allows us to call for protests. It's part of the constitutional uh, mandate that the government should be protecting. But no, they're not doing that. They turn around, they go and look for something uh, which is dubious, and then they use that to stop you from doing something that is constitutional. So what most citizens worry about when they hear the name or the word regulation is who is going to be using this regulation and against who? Is it not going to be used to stifle discourse in our society? Uh, mm -hmm. Social media is so important in Zimbabwe because Zimbabwe is the only country of significance in Africa with only one television station. In 1960, only Zimbabwe and Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa had television. Today, Nigeria has got over 113 television stations. Zimbabwe still has that one television station. So people have taken refuge in social media to try and find out what's happening in their country. And when they do that, that is when uh, government comes in. It talks about regulation. Right now, we've got a cyber bill that is being debated by the political elites. And its main aim, we know that it's to create a siege mentality of fear where people like myself, journalists, are limited in what we can do or say on social media. And yet, social media like Twitter is just like a television platform where we are supposed to broadcast news if we're newsmen or if we're just ordinary citizens, we can have our discourse and commentary on what is happening in our country. You both mentioned something, a word that um, has sort of cropped up, and that's one of the organs that the organs of the state use to police people. And that is the word shutdowns, internet shutdowns. So what I find very, there's a trial podcast dedicated now on the continent to internet shutdowns because they are now a thing. So about two years ago, we, had, we first of all had our first ever shutdown on the continent in 2007, and that was in Guinea, right? But, you know, fast forward, and in 2018, there were at least 17 instances of partial or total internet shutdowns. Now, last year, it grew to 25, okay? And for me, one of the worst cases ever was Chad, where for one year and four months, the whole of social media was banned for 16 months. So I want to ask both of you, um, Ayo especially, what recourse do citizens have by law when this type of things happen? Because I think it's going to, uh, that's my opinion, is internet shutdowns are going to continue to happen. But I mean, if the UN has said access to, in, to the internet is a basic human right, then are we going to get to a world where internet shutdowns can be regarded as a crime against humanity? Can I please um, bring us back? Please. Something can be illegal internationally without having to be a crime against humanity. Crimes against humanity involve mass murder and genocide. But so, so, the, so, so, but that doesn't mean to say that a government is not breaching international law or its in, its international treaty rights if it shuts down the internet. If, if particularly if, as our governments like to do. It has signed up to the relevant treaties which um, guarantee access to these things. I think that it's also important to understand that internet access now is the way that the modern world is operating. And certainly I think that if the Nigerian government were to wake up and say we are going to shut down the internet, then um, uh, the thing that COVID-19 had not been able to achieve in the country 
would certainly be completed by by that kind of, um, of of activity. So I think that governments have to be a little bit careful, and that's why you find that even in China, what they've had to do is to set up their own ecosystem of internet in order to allow the kind of commercial activity that goes on through the internet or that goes on online so that they can cut out the ones that are saying the things that they don't want now whether our niger our nigerian or african governments have that kind of money to waste i don't know and i would jolly well be very annoyed if they were to be wasting taxpayers money or tax income on such um frivolities but it's um it, it's something that we need to bear in mind i think that um if we are in a situation where the government says it's going to shut down the internet, it would have to close things down. It can go after people certainly in the country, but if it were to achieve the effect that it wanted to, given that there is so much coming in from outside, it would certainly have to, um, it would have to, to, to close the whole system down. And once you talk about closing the whole system down, then you're talking about severe economic damage. So um, it may happen in Guinea, it may happen in Chad, but um, I think that the African Union, if it had taken a stand on this, would definitely say that that is contrary to the human rights of Africans. I want to, however, say, Rona, please, that something may be a breach of human rights and rightly condemned as that without being elevated to the level of a crime against humanity. We are making the language so elastic that it becomes meaningless. And we, 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 should, we should really um, reserve our, we call everything genocide these days. Genocide is a very serious offense. It's a crime against humanity. Shutting down the internet is certainly something, and it, indeed it can alert to the threat of some of these crimes against humanity. But let's um, understand that we don't have to be, you know, at the International Criminal Court before we demand our rights from our governments. Correct. That was a uh, that was a question from a colleague. Um, mm. Hopewell, I'm more interested now. This is my question. What is your take on this weaponization of shutdowns? Um, particularly, particularly because you're a journalist, you're a documentary filmmaker. Um, as a journalist myself, I noticed that once it's time for the elections, which should actually be a means of educating the people, telling people what's going on, then you tend to have these shutdowns on the continent. What do you see um, as the trend going to be? In the, in, what's the trend going to be for this weaponization of the internet shutdowns on the continent? I think I mentioned something that is very important, <clears throat> the economic aspect of the shutdowns. In Zimbabwe in 2019, uh, there were protests that were taking place. And uh, the only solution for the government at that time, they felt that they had to shut down the internet. So nothing was working at all. But when I looked at uh, what the business people were saying, one of the... Um, worst things that ever happened to Zimbabwe was that shut down because it caused so much harm to business. There was a Kenyan company which controls uh, um, Pesa in Kenya and it had its servers uh, housed in Harare. And because of that shutdown, that company warned the state uh, in so many various ways through um, international organizations to say that if this happens again, then we are moving away from Zimbabwe because the world today <clears throat> operates as part of our everyday life through the internet. Mm -hmm. And if the internet is going to be shut down for political reasons, then it means Zimbabwe becomes a very unpopular and unattractive place where mm -hmm. one can come and do business. So it is true that they will be used, they've been used before and they will be used in the future by desperate regimes that do not know how to address the immediate issues that would have brought up, like in the case of Zimbabwe in 2019, the protests. And um, it might be a short-term uh, solution for governments across Africa to do so, but the harm on the economy of those countries 
will be terrible and they will have long lasting effects, not just for months, but for years. You know, this thing about money has just brought up something in my head. I will try to paraphrase it just as it's occurring to me. So you sort of notice that social media policing on the continent is now being sought of for profit. So you have places like Tanzania where they have the $900 blogger license fee, and then Uganda's government has a social media tax where people have to go and register to be able to use the internet. And they say they are doing these things to be able to um, raise money. Are we seeing a, a sort of happening where they are killing two birds with one stone? Because what you just said, Hopewell, raised up the thought of what's happening with TikTok and America, where it started with, oh, we have to be suspicious about China. We have to be suspicious, suspicious about this con company, this social media app. There's fake news. Just about the time that Black Lives Matter was starting on TikTok, was starting to gain ground. And then the US said it was going to ban it. And now all of a sudden it's that, okay, if you can make sure that the servers and I think some infrastructure is on US soil, then that's fine. So let's talk about this economic aspect of it. Where do you see this going in terms of legally? Is this state policing, state policing of social media for profit going to have any legal background, Ayo? And where do you see this going? Oh, well, I'll start with Ayo, please. I'm interested. I think we should divorce the word polluting from the issue of profit and taxation or licensing or whatever it is. The um, uh, yes, it's true that some state, um, some countries in the continent are making money out of licensing people to have for having access. But um, uh, I think that we need to separate that from the fact of policing in the sense that supposing I say that well, I've paid my bloggers fee, I can say what I like, I can do what I like, and um, uh, so I think that um, some will want to use it to make money. Um, uh, even by simply the aspect, the business of making airtime expensive or, or and so on and so forth. But I think that on the whole, I would suggest that a um, people have already had access free. They're not monetized. I don't make money from posting my comments on Twitter or from exchanging um, views on a WhatsApp group or on an email list serve. There's a separate thing from the monetization. And if it's monetization, people make money, you tax them. That's the, you tax their income. That's the, the, the way to approach it. It's more that a blogger or somebody, an independent journalist or writer said something, it took off on social media. And then months later, the same government, after they probably had the um, writer or blogger arrested for a bit, they come up with the law. There's always been some sort of incident. I, I, I appreciate that. And, and I think that it's one of the reasons why when the Nigerian constitution was being um, discussed and there is this discussion about freedom of speech and um, the Nigerian media was very keen to say that they want a specific provision in the constitution guaranteeing freedom of the press you know, or, or media freedom. And the rest of the country said that, how then do we define the press? How do we define media? There's a line between people who occasionally contribute, people whose full-time profession is, let the freedom be applicable to everybody. And the same thing should happen if we want to now prevent journalists from using the same outlets that mm. ordinary people use. The freedom of the individual is the freedom of the journalist and vice versa. So that to me, when the African Charter guarantees freedom of expression, that doesn't say freedom of expression for this group, but not for them. Mm. So I think that um, uh, we need to be very clear about saying that freedom of expression is a right that applies to everybody, whether they're a, a professional or not. If they're a professional and you want to make money from what they're doing, then you can tax them on their income. 
if they are a professional or even a private person and what they say is not true, the answer is not simply to just shut them down, but for you government to be a little bit more alert and to come out with your own response. I mean, I think that part of the problem, I, I don't know what it's like in Zim, but here in Nigeria, government is often so slow to respond. Um, uh, it's a fact um, of life even before the internet that um, the lie is halfway around the world before the truth has even got its boots on. But really, I, I see sometimes I look at my government and I say, please wake up. And, um, you know, the real answer to hate speech, to false news, to fake news, to fabrication is facts, response with facts. But if governments are getting into the business of saying, we don't even want the facts, if the facts don't look good for, for us, then I think that um, we have to have that pushback. Well, Paul, would you like to add anything to that in terms of um, taxing of social media use or taxing of um, independent journalists? Um, I think I, I totally agree with what uh, I was saying because if I am a journalist and I'm on Twitter and my activities start earning me money, you tax that money that I've earned. You don't um, tax me for getting onto the platform before I've even spoken. Mm. So what we're seeing in countries like Niger, what we're seeing in countries like Tanzania, where the taxing is proactive even before they've started mm. earning anything. Mm. Yes, it's ridiculous. I've seen it in Uganda as well. I I have 164,000 followers on Twitter, and mm. according to some of the cyber laws that are being uh, debated across the continent. I must be taxed on the basis of the people that are following me, which is absolutely ridiculous because I'm not making any money. Hold on, hold on. I, you mean you are taxed on the basis of how many followers you have? Yes, in Uganda they were debating the legislation on uh, social media. And one of the things that came up was that if you have X amount of followers, this is how much you must, uh, you must pay. And it, it doesn't make sense because, um, you know, it's like having a concert. Twitter is like having a concert. And then people come to that concert. And the singer is singing. They've been paid at the gate. They collect their money and the state taxes them from that money uh, that was paid on the gate. But what this, these states are trying to say is that before, before I've even started the concert, I must pay them something. This is meant to stop people like uh, myself who have successfully used social media um, to, to reach a wider audience than the state controlled media has been able to do so. And this is by no means just an African phenomenon. It comes down to issues around um, in institutions. Mm -hmm. If Donald Trump had the opportunity to behave like Emerson Mnangagwa in Zimbabwe, he would do so. But the institutions in America stop him from doing so. And I think it means that we need to strengthen our institutions in order to help get some kind of strong pushback against dictatorships that try to use this kind of uh, draconian laws to stop people from engaging. And I agree with I as well that the freedom to speak should be guaranteed with the freedom after you have spoken. And the freedom to speak should not be about a specific group, but about every citizen. We should all be free to speak, as long as what we are saying does not infringe on other people's rights. Okay, I've just been informed that we are joined by Yemi Adamolekun. Um, Yemi, thank you for joining us. I'll just introduce you again. Mm -hmm. Those who have just joined us as well, Yemi is the executive director of Enough is Enough Nigeria. Um, you'll hear us call it EID for short. It's a nonpartisan network of individuals and organizations that are committed to building a culture of good governance and public accountability in Nigeria. Welcome, Yemi. Thank you. My apologies. No problem. Thank you for joining us. I'm now going to laser focus on you because 
you know, I really wish I could have had your perspective on a lot of things. So let me quickly ask you, the protests that resulted in um, your organization, EIE, being a registered entity by 2011, I mean, these were nationwide protests. They were primarily organized by Blackberry Messenger. Apologies mm -hmm. for anybody who is too young to understand what that was. Um, and then uh, I think yeah, also use text messaging and Facebook and Twitter to a lesser degree. So what has changed over the years in terms of um, state interference? I won't use policing anymore, but in terms of state interference from a civil society perspective, what are you seeing as you continue your work? The 2010 protest, I was an invited guest. A friend of mine just said, oh, there's a protest in Abuja. I just finished my MBA. I was doing my youth service. I had time. I was like, oh, that sounds like fun. And I flew to Abuja for the protest. So for the Abuja and Lagos protest, there was no, in a sense, opposition. Yeah, to the degree that the National Assembly was barricaded and they didn't want us to go in, yes. But it wasn't, there weren't, and I guess in terms from the organizer's perspective, there wasn't a sense of don't do it, don't come out, we would come after you type of mindset. Lagos was even a lot more peaceful than Abuja was. Fashola was governor at the time. But fast forward 10 years, EIE is 10 this year. Um, the environment and the tone of the, this administration towards public dissent has gotten quite significantly worse. Uh, journalists are being picked up. Court orders are not obeyed. Yeli's Shores case is a classic example. Uh, there's another journalist from Akwa Ibom who's also being kept. And also citizens, now that we have the Cybercam Act of 2015, abusing your senator or your governor on Facebook to land you in jail because their feelings were hurt. Not because what you said was wrong or not because you lied, so which libel will sort out, but because they were hurt that you were insulting. So I think the climate has changed significantly, even as citizens have found their voice, if I want to use that word, and a lot more vocal in their criticism of government. So we've also spoken about the fact that um, state policing is achieved by either legislation or taxing um, of people. And just now, Hopewell had just told us about how these taxes are sort of proactive, even before you can do anything. Uh, he's actually just blown us away with the fact that in some countries you are going to be taxed based on the number of Twitter followers you have. Followers. Yeah, I, mean, I know that law came to Nigeria. I don't know how you are going to cope because you have a lot of Twitter followers. But my question is, what's your take on this? Are you, from your CSO perspective, are you seeing more of this sort of proactive taxing of perceived opposition state actors? Well, I think that will be tricky for the government, at least in the Nigerian context, because they've used social media quite, quite a lot. Them and said. part of the joke is that, yes, exactly. And part of the joke is that they came into office on the back of social media, and you're now in office, you now want to do your social media bill, your anti-hate speech bill, and whatever other legislature you're trying to put in place. But yeah, you're right. That's sort of extreme in sense of how do we, and the, the point is simply just control. How do we control what people say and how they say it? Not because what they're saying is wrong, but because we don't like what, how it reflects on us and what it says about us. So I'm not quite sure we will, be able, we will get to that level, but the social media bill is something it's come back up again. Um, we thought we had killed it last year, but it's something that with every twist and turn, what the government continues to say is that we don't like dissent. We don't like criticism, and in any way we can do it to ensure that it doesn't happen, we will. And I think that's been communicated by the Nigerian government very, very clearly. Okay, so we're sort of rounding up, and I must hear from all of you on this. So to use a, a quote from Zimbabwe, there's this gray area that I think is an important aspect of state policing of social media. So in June 2017, Professor Jonathan Moyo, who used to be Zimbabwe's Minister of Education, tweeted, and I quote, the people are the state and not any fragment or path thereof. So everyone, my question to you is in this world of influencers, fake news, coordinated bot activity and cancel culture, 
are we seeing the people themselves exerting state policing of social media? I mean, what are the highlights for you or the low points um, mm -hmm. as this phenomenon unfolds? Hopewell, would you like to start? I think my experience and our experience in Zimbabwe is that where, wherever the state has tried to intervene, as they did in 2019 during the protests that were taking place, they shut down the internet, but the citizens went around it. They downloaded software that allowed them to continue communicating. Uh, Professor Jonathan Moyer, that you quoted, is the former information minister who is now out of favor with the current regime and is now living in, in, in Kenya. Yeah. Uh, yes. And he has a followership of about 650,000. And he has used it devastatingly against the current regime, putting out information that the current government does not want to be put out, uh, creating some kind of discourse uh, and commentary that the current government does not want. So in a way, so far, the people have uh, prevailed in making sure that they continue using Twitter, Facebook, as a force for good, although the government sees it as a negative force because it exposes it. It exposes its weaknesses, its incompetencies, its corrupt behavior, the plundering of national resources, the looting of uh, public funds. And, and because of that, the people are more determined to safeguard in as far as they can do. Technically, they can't stop the government from uh, shutting down the internet. But because technology is moving so fast, you know, the good news for people who are perceived to be uh, descenders is that African governments are not as fast as they should be, as I would say, mm -hmm. in terms of keeping up with the technology itself. That's why you find that here in Zimbabwe, we still have only one television station, the only African country to be in such a situation. Whereas the government did not understand that television can now be a, a phenomenon on mobile phones. Uh, it can now be something that is taken from Twitter, from Facebook. And so they come up with these silly and draconian laws, but they're so outdated that they don't keep pace with the technological uh, advances that are taking place. So in a way, we are living in a world where the African governments, some of them are going to be making absolutely idiotic uh, laws to try and deal with a problem that perhaps will be difficult to deal with. All they needed to do was to adapt to the new world and to understand that transparency is the way forward. But we have a problem in Zimbabwe, as you saw with my arrest, I spent 45 days in a maximum prison simply because I had used Twitter to expose corruption, the looting of $60 million meant for COVID-19. In a normal scenario, the government would have been happy and should have thanked journalists to say, you have saved this country with this money. But no, we were incarcerated. They went to my Twitter account. They looked for some uh, four tweets which they thought uh, would justify what they were trying to do. And then boom, they said that you're trying to incite the citizens into violence simply because I've endorsed an anti-corruption uh, demonstration, which is uh, guaranteed and enshrined in our constitution. Um, Ayo, could we have, could we have, you know, leveraging on what he has just said, Popol has just said about um, the whole constitutional aspect being twisted to suit whoever is in power. What's your take on this? Um, the people being the state and policing, um, sort of policing social media from a legal angle. Well, I mean, the, the, the truth is that the people is not a monolith. We are more than um, we have different views. And um, I think that one thing that I've noticed, because when the, um, this, I think it's the hate speech bill, I can't remember, there's so many of them. <laughs> we already have a cyber crimes bill which was passed by the previous administration. And it, um, if there's any gap in connection with the use of the internet for um, spreading falsity and all the rest of it, the cyber crimes bill, quite frankly, covers it. But now our senators, as Yemi said, continue to come up with this idea that we must um, 
hate speech is going to be defined as not only um, uh, things that are actually designed to incite hatred against people because of their their identity, but also um, uh, as what might um, bring somebody into ridicule, whether or not it's true, and, and so on. Now, when that bill came up before, the president was categorical that he would not enact such legislation. And he's, wab he's laboring under a weight of his previous existence, as I said, as a military dictator responsible for the obnoxious decree number four. And so, in a way, the people who we need to fear more than the president are the people who are doing the policing. I, I mentioned the case of this cartoon um, earlier in the discussion, Rona, yeah. and it was interesting to me to see how it is people who support the administration who were objecting to the cartoon and um, uh, saying that and calling it hate speech, false news, and so on and so forth, simply because it did not cover the entire spectrum from A to Z of what they felt should be in a cartoon, you see. So that I think that um, we cannot simply um, put ourselves in the situation of saying the people, because in many ways the people, and this applies not just to the people who support the government, it equally applies to the people who oppose the government. I've seen a lot of um, intolerance and um, exaggeration, criticism of people who don't share the same views. But I think in the end, I mean, Yemi mentioned the cases of um, Yele Showere and um, the other young man from um, Cross River or from Agba Ibom who fell in. Agba Jale. And the fact is that it is because of social media that their cases could not go quiet. They were, um, in fact, the government has had to obey the orders that were made on their, in respect of those um, two people because social media, the Nigerian people, the, or the people, took up the role that um, uh, the government should have taken up to say, uh, particularly because I think it's also important for us to realize that we have a federal system here and the federal government has its own issues which have to be battled. But much worse goes on in the parts where the eye of the media is not focused so that in the states i mean once you're outside lagos you can get away with a lot if you happen to be in abia or bauchi or as they discovered in cross river that the, the 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 governors there can be even more intolerant and have less opposition so i think that the actual role of the social media in such cases is also to draw government's attention to the fact that it's breaking its own laws and um, in the end, I, I take the point that Yemi makes, but I think that we can fall into the expectation of, um, of being shut down and then start to tailor what we say or do. The fact is that every wrong thing that our government has done or is doing is on the internet. We learn about it from the internet. If we don't hear about it, it's what we normally hear about it. Something has happened and nobody is talking. So I think that um, actually the answer is not to shut down, not to feel intimidated, but rather to continue pushing the envelope. And the business of government is that where the facts are wrong, they need to be fast and they need to come out with the correct facts. And that has happened in some cases. A lot of the things that are going on in social media are happening outside the public sphere in groups like WhatsApp and so on, where nobody really knows what is happening unless they have a mole in the group. Yes, as we've seen in, on different occasions. There's something you raised, Ayo, that I really want Yemi to respond to. Yemi, I'm going to sort of put you on the spot. So Ayo raised the point where she said the main people who had the worst things to say about a cartoonist who was opposing the government were actually ordinary people. And that you mm. it's always subject to the whims or the leanings of the people on social media. So Yemi, in 2015, you had this mantra 
Um, and I remember reading it, um, I think it was on the site of uh, Deutsche Welle Academy. And what you said was, trust those online to inform those offline. That was 2015. Now, do you really think you can trust the people in terms of mm. social media to inform, given that, you know, as Ms. Ayo said, there's WhatsApp with all sorts of things happening there. What's your take now? The idea then, and I still to a certain degree believe it, is that social media self-corrects so that if there is false information, somebody will say the truth. However, the challenge that we then have is the balance of voices. So if you take this current administration who has a whole army of trolls that they are paying to spew whatever it is that they believe to be their truth. <clears throat> I mean, they camp in my mentions and it's always just very interesting reading some of the things they talk about. I mean, numerous people reach out to me and say, oh, I'm so sorry, oh, we should, should respond to them. I said, who has time to respond to trolls? I'm just validating them by responding to them. But you're quite right. So I, I still very much believe that social media corrects. And, but it's harder to find the truth. So the, the, in that, and then the context of that is that the truth is there if you're looking for it. Mm. But if you have paid trolls whose job is to push an agenda, you will see a hundred pieces of content that speaks to their agenda or what they're trying to push out. And the truth will be in two or three pieces buried somewhere. Now, will you find it? Maybe not. And that then becomes a problem. And um, one of the things that has happened over the five, it's, it's this whole troll farms. I mean, and we've seen it in the US, US yeah, politics and the rest. This is a, yeah, so th exactly. So the ability to basically pay people, not only to push out a narrative, but because of the, the algorithm of these platforms, those narratives then self-reinforce and that then becomes what you see and almost then in a sense frames your truth. So one of the things, for example, that to your point, Rowan, has changed EIE over the last five years is that we now have a presence on radio. When we started 10 years ago, we were very social media focused. It's cheaper, it's easier. And we were speaking to an audience that was also literate. I've been very clear over my tenure as, le as a, the lead at EIE that we can't speak to everybody. And because of that, the focus is on educated people. So we started off with the young educated people. Now we say generally educated people because the audience on social media has also increased in terms of age bracket. So people who have access to technology, who are literate and who can understand and communicate with these platforms are those that we focus on. And the idea was that those who then take information they get online, which speaks to the quote that you were reminding me of, and then educate people offline. We say something that your thumb is the only finger that you have that can touch your other fingers very easily. Other fingers can, but they won't be as cute, but your thumb does it and it's really quite cute. So the idea for us was that if you that have access to information on social media are a thumb, you can find four people offline that you then educate and then spread the word and the exponential value of that would hopefully change the access that people have and how they think. Fortunately, with this context of, of that we're talking about, that's a lot harder. So we then pivoted to radio. So as of last year, we had radio programs in 25 states of Nigeria. So once a week, we would have an hour tagged Office of the Citizen. And the idea was to give citizens an opportunity to ask questions and get information that empowers them to act. So you're complaining, blah, 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 blah. This is the person responsible. This is the person's phone number. This is the person's office address. Go find them, go engage, and stop ranting on radio or social media. But the idea was then just to balance. So it's not just saying that social media will give you the information you need, but also speaking to a different audience where radio, and radio is the largest um, media channel in Nigeria. So um, I'm going to actually, I wish we could continue, but I, I you know, <laughs> yeah. I can't even believe time flies when you're talking about social media policing by the state. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, well, I'm going to ask you, this is a, we're in a post-truth world where, you know, it's like appealing to emotion, whether it's normal news, structured news on traditional media, whether it's on social media, whether it's even just in communication. Um, it's about appealing to emotion. It's about the human angle, which has been used to both good and devastating effect. So I'm going to ask all of you 
last question. How do we redefine our relationship with the truth in this social media age? Hope well. I think the uh, truth in the social media age is some kind of uh, exaggerated um, uh, concept because we have always had a problem. I mean, as a journalist, I can tell you that in the 70s, in the 60s, they were facing a problem, but they just didn't have the same uh, magnitude in terms of uh, amplifying the messages or the news or the documentaries that we see today. The kind of stuff that Trump is doing today was being done in the 60s as well, but the platforms were just different. So I think, as Jamie said, there's going to be a lot of uh, troll farms. We have them in Zimbabwe. We even have one that sits in the office, uh, you know, peddling all these lies and um, engaging people. But ultimately, uh, the citizen has to find a way of getting to the truth if they are looking for the truth. You are not going mm -hmm. to be able to stop the trolls. You are not going to be able to stop uh, the propagandists and, and the liars. But we just have to understand that with so many uh, social media platforms, uh, we are also going to have so many liars coming onto them. Um, ordinarily, uh, even ordinary citizens without uh, power or politics involved, um, involved, they will lie about the type of car they drive. They will lie about their lifestyle. You know, they will post people in places and claiming that this, these are their homes. So it's, mm. it's, it's difficult to really control that. You just have to make sure that the key ingredients remain the same. The truth, fact uh, checking, and uh, telling the people that this is the truth, this is a lie, and showing why it, it is a lie. So for someone like myself, uh, with the stature that I had uh, uh, as a journalist, um, there, there are ways of making sure that I don't peddle lies. So mm -hmm. if you go to Twitter, a blue tick, they verify, which means your account becomes a, a trusted account as mm -hmm. opposed to just uh, hope watching on at the village uh, who can say anything and who is not. Yeah, me, how are we redefining our relationship with the truth on social media? Hmm. I think I'll pick up where I hope we're left off is really becoming, what's it called, synonymous with truth and not peddling fake news. And I think that that invariably for citizens and platforms looking for the truth, you just know that, you know what, if I go to A, B and C, I'll know that what I get is accurate. And EIE for me, and it's one of the things that I've been proud of over our, our 10 years, under a PDP government, we were accused of being APC because we criticize the PDP government. Now under an APC government, we're being very vocally accused of being PDP because we're accusing or criticizing an APC government. And for me, that simply means that we haven't changed, that we've seen what is wrong and we're speaking to it. So that, and I think this also goes back to that question. So for people who are actually looking for truth, they can find it. But unfortunately, it must be just like to so Hopewell's point about gov um, government and their willingness to be transparent. You must want to be transparent. Otherwise, everything you design or you work around is, will clamp down on that because you have no such desire. So if you're looking for truth, you will find it. And I'll end with J.K. Rollins as an example. Now, J.K. Rollins has very much said this whole issue about um, trans women and a womb and that conversation. She was like, I'm not negating your truth, but you can't make me any... You can't negate mine by saying that I can't talk about having a womb. I have a womb, I was born with one. Now, you've changed your gender from a man to a woman. Obviously you don't have a womb and that's fine, but you can't tell me who I am. And she's gotten massively attacked by that. And I find that extremely fascinating because there's nothing she said that's not truth. But trans women want to redefine truth so that it suits their own being. And I love the fact that J.K. Rollins damning what might happen to her brand and her sales. They say, no, 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 that's not acceptable. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that, or rather we should see a lot more of that in redefining what this whole thing as truth is. It's not, a, it's not an elastic thing that I bend as I'm feeling. If I wake up today and I want to be a woman, I'm a woman. Tomorrow I want to be a man, I'm a man. And you're supposed to accept that as my truth. Yeah, problems. So I, I just think that we eventually will identify that wanting to own your truth cannot negate somebody else's. And again, the same thing about rights. 
to say that you have rights can infringe on, on someone else's rights. So interesting time we're in. Very interesting. I do you get to round us off on this with your opinion? Well, I have to challenge your idea that we're in a post-truth era. Go, no. go for it, please. <laughs> <I haven't been laughs> David Ulushoga's book um, that I bought at the Tanake Festival as it happens, in which um, black people were defined on the basis of what was written in the Holy Bible as people who were to be enslaved by their light-skinned brothers. That was the truth then. And I'm sure that mm -hmm. Dr. Gerber would have a thing or two to tell you about post-truth don't let us think that we are doing something unique. We have some unique tools, but don't let us delude ourselves that the ideas of telling lies to stay in power, telling lies to eject people from power, telling lies to make ourselves feel good, not, there's nothing new about any of that. And the fact is that every stage we have responded with the facts. As um, Yemi mm -hmm. said, the fact is, J.K. Rowling was born with a wound. Some people who now are calling themselves women were not. Those are facts. Now, yeah. we want to redefine mm -hmm. the expression woman to include those who were not born with women but now identify as that's a different matter. That may be why we are falling into the idea that it is all post-truth. But I would suggest that it is not um, for us to assume that we are unique and that we have unique challenges that we cannot deal with. Personally, if I, we can all make mistakes on, on, online, and we all do. The people that I continue to respect and follow are those who, when their mistakes are pointed out, they correct them and say, oh, we got that wrong. There's nothing, it's, it's not illegal. We are, as they say, the man who never made a mistake never made anything. And that's for the woman, we don't make mistakes. But the point is that we should understand that the answer to darkness continues to be the use of light. I appreciate the point that Yemi had made about the audience that you get. And in a way we can confine ourselves in the Twitterverse and think that it's the real world. And obviously it's not. But at the end of the day, we, if we decide to confine ourselves into a particular sphere, when we get out into the real world, we should understand that there's a different dynamic going on. I do believe that um, we have to, at the moment, we are still at the stage of regulating ourselves when it comes to social media. And because the fact is that the, the, I, I'm always accused of um, being paid by the um, Buhari government whenever I say something nice about them. I wish, <laughs> you know. And um, so it is, um, I, I like to look at what is the person saying and less at who is the person saying it. It may be a troll. And of course, if it's only got three followers, and it may be. But sometimes you want to take up a point and sometimes you don't. It is um, a fact as um, governments will try to wake up and say, aha, yes. And, and I mean, because the mullahs in Iran had factories or farms of people trolling out the um, Ayatollah's truth um, uh, while we were still saying, uh, how can we get to um, uh, join the internet? So it's not, the, the, these things are, um, are not new and they've had their effect. But in the end, we are, because we are in the fulcrum, as I said, we're between that space where everybody can broadcast, but um, people who want to broadcast have to have a license. Sure. And um, mm. because we're in that space where we accept that you need a license to broadcast, but we don't accept that you need a license to send out, um, to, to, to publish a newspaper or, 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 or whatever, we still have to work it out. And as I said, there are no easy, answers to the question. But um, on the whole, I tend to lean in favor of um, truth. I think that um, when people are challenged, particularly if what they're spreading is both. I mean, I had somebody talking about Hitler and um, the freedoms that Germans enjoyed or when they were not Jewish. And I had to sort of say, no, these are the facts about what was happening. Now, there's no acknowledgement that I got it wrong. But 
you know that other people will also hear and understand and some will understand some will not we cannot at the moment because even if we say that a particular government we trust i was on the police service commission we had a non-policeman as um, appointed as our chairman and it was all very nice since then every person in charge of that police service commission has been a former police officer. And it tells you that what sounds good when it's told, ah, oh, it's going to have this person and that person, it's going to be very nice. And then the next thing is that um, after you've got the system in place, then something comes up which you weren't expecting. At the moment, we have to stay with our freedoms and governments have to manage them. They have to learn to live with the ridicule, the fun poking, and we ourselves will take down those who want to spread the hatred and the mm -hmm. disinformation. Thank you very much. On that note, we want to say thank you for being with us on social media, the truth and the threat of media policing by the states. Thank you very much, Hopewell, for your insights. Thank you, Ms. Ayo. Thank you very much, Yemi. And we thank hope you enjoy the rest of the Ake Festival program. It's been an honor to have you as our guest. Thank you. Five Minutes Madness, only you can understand. Spectre. Visit myspectre.com to get your Spectre experience. Spectre, loans in five minutes. <laughs>